Okay, just one second and we will be ready to go. All right, so we are going to Chanchai Radamato. How about that? And this is supposed to be our Sunday feast program in Nuluka. We, because we're on lockdown, we don't have any Sunday feast program, but this is whatever program we can muster up on Sunday. And we're going to continue with the study of the Bhagavad Gita on the 12th chapter, beginning with text 17. All right, let's chant Jai Radhamadava. Oh, my picture. Okay. Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunyabihari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunyabihari Gopi Janaballava Giri Varadhadi Gopi Jana Vallahuva Kiribadadhadi Vishodananda Braja Jana Ranjana Vishodananda Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Banachari Yamuna Tira Banachari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunya Bihati Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunya Bihati Gopi Jana Balaha Ma Kiri Badhati Gopi Jana Balapa Giri Bharadhaudi Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yashoda Nandana Braja Jana Ranjana Yamuna Tira Manachari Yamuna Tira Manachari Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunya Bihati Jaya Radha Madhuva Kunya Bihati Jaya Vishnupad Paramahansa Paravita Vacharya Satata Satashi Shimad His Divine Grace Sabaya Charanada Vatabhananda Gosami Shila Prabhupada ki jai, Iskan founder Acharya, Shila Prabhupada ki jai. Ananda Goti of Vaishnav Rindi ki jai, Namacharya, Shila Huila Staku ki jai. Parem, Se Kaho Sri Krishna Chaitanya, Prabhu Nichananda Shidway de Garadha, Shiva Siddhi Gaur, Bhakta Rindi ki jai, Shri Sri Radhakrishna Gopi Gopi Nath, Shine Kun Radhakunda, Giri Govardhan ki jai, Vrindavan ki jai, Vajuran ki jai. Jagaratha Sami Gajai Yamuna Mai Gajai Shimani Tolasi Dev Gajai Samaveda Bhakta Vrindi Gajai Go Premananda Hari Hari Go All glorious the assembled devotees All glorious the assembled devotees All glorious the assembled devotees All glorious to Shri Guru and Gauranga Srila Prabhupada Gajai Go Premananda Hari 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 Go Gajai Krishna Pastai Bhutale Shimani Bhaktivedanta Swami Namani Namaste Saraswati Devi Gauravati Pajani Nivasisha Sindhuvati Pasyacha Dejitarani Okay, welcome to the Sunday virtual feast at Nugaloka, which for many of you is Monday morning, but that's okay. 
So, uh, we're going to be doing our Bhagavad Gita class and then an announcement at the end regarding Radhastami and the initiations that will take place on the 26th. So, Omagana Tumadanda Shah, Gananjana Shilakya Chokshu, Nanditam, Yena Tosmai, Shikadu Maha, I offer my respectful obeisances unto the lotus feet of my spiritual master, His Divine Grace A.C. Bhaktivedanta Swami Shilapalpa who so kindly opened my eyes with a torchlight of knowledge when I was blinded in the darkness of ignorance. So, we will go ahead to the Bhagavad Gita, the 12th chapter, and we're on text 17. Now, these last few verses of the 12th chapter deal with Krishna basically saying different things about personalities, especially devotees, <laughs> who are dear to him or very dear to him, and at the end you'll have a devotee who is very, very dear to him. Okay? So we're going to discover how you can become dear to Krishna. Beginning with text 17. No na rishyati na dvishti na sochyati na kankshyati shubha shubha parityagi bhakti manya same priyaha Ya one who na never rishyati takes pleasure na never dvishti grieves na never Sochati laments, na never, kangshati desires, shuba of the auspicious, ashuba of the inauspicious, parityagi renouncer, bhakti man, devotee, ya, one who saw he is, made to me, priyaha, dear. One who neither rejoices nor grieves, who neither laments nor desires, and who renounces both auspicious and inauspicious things, such a devotee is very dear to me. Now, this is a very high standard, of course, <clears throat> because we rejoice when we get something we want, and we're upset when we lose something, or we don't get something, and we're lamenting and desiring. But this is described, Brahmabhuta uh, Pratsanata Nashochati Nakankshati Samaksarveshu Bhutechu Mad Bhakti Nabate Param. So what is on the spiritual platform? Uh, he doesn't hanker for anything, and he doesn't lament. No lamentation, no hankering. Same thing is here. This is actually pretty much the same thing as that verse says. And if we can come to that platform, we'd be very dear to Krishna. Purport. A pure devotee is neither happy nor distressed over material gain and loss, nor is he very much anxious to get a son or disciple, nor is he distressed by not getting them. <laughs> If he loses anything which is very dear to him, he does not lament. Similarly, similarly, if he does not get what he desires, he is not distressed. He is transcendental in the face of all kinds of auspicious, inauspicious, and sinful activities. doesn't mean he does sinful activities. It doesn't mean he does inauspicious activities. And all activities he do, does are auspicious because they're always for Krishna. That's auspicious. But he may see different things happening around him that are inauspicious or sinful. But he's transcendental to all those things. He is prepared to accept all kinds of risks for the satisfaction of the Supreme Lord. Nothing is an impediment in the discharge of his devotional service. Such a devotee is very dear to Krishna. Hmm. It's very interesting. Nothing is an impediment uh, in, his in the discharge of his devotional service. In other words, there's a very interesting verse in the Bhagavatam. Mm. So the, the verse basically says, the supreme religious principle is to render devotional service unto Krishna, pure devotional service unto Krishna. And that devotional service is qualified by the uh, symptoms of ahaituki and apratyata. So what does ahaituki mean? There is no cause for his pure devotional service, no material cause. <coughs> there are spiritual causes such as good association, chanting the Lord's holy names, having the right attitude, 
avoiding offenses, etc., like that, but no material cause, anyone in any condition, whether you are super intelligent, whether you are not intelligent at all, whether you are strong, whether you are weak, whether you are a man, whether you are a woman, <coughs> it doesn't matter. There is no material precondition. And anyone who imposes a material precondition or thinks that there is a material precondition is actually in Maya. So there's no impediments, material impediments, in the discharge of devotional service. But there are spiritual impediments, such as lack of association with devotees, uh, such as, you know, your material desires like that. But as far as things that block your devotional service, excuses that you can use, no. It's just an excuse. So, a haituki and a pratyata. A pratyata means that there is nothing that can stop your devotional service. So this is exactly what Prabhupada is talking about here. Nothing is an impediment in the discharge of his devotional service. Such a devotee is very dear to Krishna. Next two verses. Samashatra chamitre cha tatamana pamanyoho sitoshna sukha dukkeshu samaksanga vivarjitaha kuyananda stitirmoni santushto yena kena chit Aniketa stira matir bhakti man me priyo naraha. Samaha equal Shatra to an enemy, cha also, mitre to a friend, cha also, tata so, mana in honor, apamana yoho in dishonor, shita in cold, ushna heat, sukha happiness, dukeshu and distress, sama equal poise. Sangavibarjita, free from all association. Tuya equal, ninda in defamation, stuti and repute. Moni, silent, santushtaha, satisfied, yena, kina, chit, with anything. Ani ketaha, having no residence. Stira, fixed, matahi, determination, bhakti, man, engage in devotion, may to me. Priyaha, dear, nadaha, a man. It's interesting. Uh, the word for female is nari. It's interesting. Man is naraha, naraha, or nara, and nari. One who is equal to friends and enemies, who is equal poised in honor and dishonor, heat and cold, happiness and distress, fame and infamy, who is always free from contaminated association, always silent and satisfied with anything, who does not care for any residence, who is fixed in knowledge, and is engaged in devotional service, such a person is very dear to me. So, in order to be equal poise, that's sama is the word, that is, to friends and enemies, honor and dishonor, heat and cold, happiness and distress, fame and infamy, uh, basically, one has to be absorbed in one's spiritual identity. Because if you try to become equal poised, through material means, just thinking, oh, honor, dishonor, I have to be equal poised. There's no motivation for doing that, plus you can't do it. The only way to do it is to have some other identity other than this material, than this material identity. And of course, in the beginning, that identity is as a servant of Krishna and the spiritual master. And at the end, when one is fully realized, that identity is in terms of one's spiritual form, activities, service in the spiritual world. And one fully identifies with that. So, therefore, one is no longer attached. Uh, we find out that uh, misery in this material world is due to attachment. Of course, that's Buddhism 101. Uh, the material world is miserable. Misery is caused by attachment. Give up the attachment. Give up the miseries. And, of course, Buddha says by the Eightfold Path, you can do that. We also have a manifold path that is called bhakti yoga. Because the end is you're fully identifying yourself uh, as a spiritual entity. Not that you're negating the material identification, but automatically the material identification fades away when you have the real identification. Makes sense. So, and then another point there 
is who is always free from contaminating association. And we've talked about that before because association anything with anything in this world means association with the modes of nature. Karnam Guna Sangasha Sadasa Janma Jonishu. So you got these three modes of nature, goodness, passion, ignorance, the Sattva Rajas Tamas. And depending on which mode you associate with, it colors your consciousness. It's like a filter that comes in front of a white light. The light is white. Yet, when the filter is there, the, right may, the light may appear red, blue, or non-existent, depending upon the type of filter that's front, in front of you. So, uh, we attain different filters of our consciousness by associating with different people, association with different types of music, association with different types of food. That's why Krishna spends more than a hundred verses in the Bhagavad Gita talking about the modes of nature. We gave a class about that a few days ago. Can you imagine that? A hundred verses talking about the modes of nature. Food in the modes of nature, determination in the modes of nature, uh, understanding in the modes of nature, uh, people in the modes of nature. Pretty good. So we have to be very, very careful about these modes of nature. We may not see the modes of nature. They're there. And they affect it. They're subtle forces. There's many subtle forces in this world that are affecting us that we are not conscious of, at least externally. So always silent means never saying anything else other than something that pertains to Krishna or service to Krishna. And being satisfied, knowing that whatever Krishna sends is what you're supposed to have. And Krishna says, Nitya Nitya Nam Chaitanam Chaitanam Eko Bhavanam Yogadadati Kama that I am supplying, not me, Krishna, is supplying all the needs of all the living entities. And who doesn't care for any residents. Now that's a very high standard of renunciation. And it's described about the six Goswamis of Vrindavan that they would reside under a different tree every night, or at least not more than three nights, and not spending more than three nights in a particular location. In general, I mean, there's some exceptions to that. The reason for that is one gets attached. But of course, if one's residence is used to serve Krishna, then that attachment to one's residence, that is attachment for the service to Krishna, is spiritual. So fixed in knowledge, that means knowledge of Krishna, and also engaged in devotional service. We understand that such a person is very dear to Krishna. So let's hear Srila Prabhupada's purport. A devotee is always free from bad associations. Sometimes one is praised and sometimes one is defamed. That is the nature of human society. But a devotee is always transcendental to artificial fame and infamy, distress, or happiness. He is very patient. He does not speak of anything but the topics about Krishna. Therefore, he is called silent, is what I just said. Silent does not mean that one should not speak. Silent means that one should not speak nonsense. One should speak only of essentials, and the most essential speech for the devotee to speak uh, is to speak for the sake of the Supreme Lord. That doesn't mean that a devotee is just like some fanatic. I was just listening to a memory the devotees told about Srila Prabhupada. Srila Prabhupada was telling this story about Gopal Bhan. He usually liked to tell stories about Gopal Bhan. Gopal Bhan was a joker. And Gopal Bhan, anyway, he was a joker that was connected with the king and he did so many funny things. And Prabhupada was telling his story and the devotee was hearing the story and the devotee was thinking, what connection does that have with Krishna? And Prabhupada sort of replying to that, thought of the devotee said, it is very subtle. <laughs> so a devotee, you know, is a person too. There's that uh, one story when Prabhupada was on an airplane and during the flight they were playing a movie. And that movie happened to be a uh, Charlie Chaplin movie. I don't know if any of you would know who Charlie Chaplin is, but that's for my days, my youth, 
And so anyway, so they were playing this movie, and the devotees were trying not to look, you know, just chanting Hare Krishna, Hare Krishna, and Prabhupada was looking, and Prabhupada was laughing. What was he laughing at? You know, one particular episode, Charlie Chaplin, uh, who was a joker, was at a ball dance. I think you understand what a ball dance is anyway. A formal dance. And he was wearing something called a tuxedo. So wearing his tuxedo one time, he went to the bathroom, and he sat down, and somehow the tuxedo got ripped. And when he saw that, it was partially ripped. He ripped it all the way up so it was in two pieces. And he came out, and he was dancing with those two pieces of the tuxedo flapping by his side. And when everybody else saw that, they didn't make fun of him. They actually copied him. So Prabhupada told that as a joke. Uh, and Prabhupada was watching the movie, of course, too. And Prabhupada said, uh, yes, we should set an example that people will copy us. <laughs> like that. So anyway. So uh, a devotee is happy in all conditions. Sometimes he may get very palatable food stuff, sometimes not, but he is satisfied. What a Christian sense. Nor does he care for any residential facility. He may sometimes live underneath a tree. And he may sometimes live in a very palatial building. He is attracted to neither. He is called fixed because he is fixed in his determination and knowledge. One may find some repetition in the descriptions of the qualifications of a devotee, but this is just to emphasize the fact that a devotee must acquire all these qualifications. Without good qualifications, a devotee, uh, no, sorry, one cannot be a pure devotee. Arabha Bhaktasya told Mahad Guna. When it was not a devotee, he has no good qualification. I think I spoke about that before, but it bears telling again. Uh, this is a verse that Prabhupada would often quote. Yashasti, Bhakti, Bhagavacca, Kinjana, Salar, Guna, Statra, Samasate, Sura, Arabhavatasha, Kuto, Mahad Guna, Mano, Retain, Asati, Dalvato, Bahi. That a devotee automatically has good qualities because he is associated with the transcendental mold of goodness. And it's fixed in his consciousness because he's a devotee. It's not wavering. It's not sometimes he's in goodness, sometimes he's in passion, sometimes he's in ignorance. Whereas someone who is not God conscious, and we're not speaking in the sectarian way, anyone who is God conscious, spiritual conscious in any uh, bona fide spiritual path will also be steady. Of course, in the uh, progressive path of devotional service, that is called nishta. Nishta means stable, steady. And in this particular context, it means 24-7. 24-7 means he's not only steady when he goes into the church or goes into the temple, and does his bhajan or chanting or prayers or whatever he does there. But he's steady throughout the rest of his life. Uh, his life is like an open book. So uh, we find many people who actually have good spiritual practices, but after the practices are over on a daily basis or whatever, uh, all hell breaks loose. So we should be able to see especially when looking for a guru. A guru should be one who is 24-7 engaged in Krishna's service. Not someone who just speaks nicely, but someone who speaks nicely and acts nicely. Uh, these are the qualities desired. Tad viganartam valgurum eva abhigachet samitpani shotriyam brahmanishtam. This description is there. That one must accept a guru but the qualities of the guru that one should look for is samitpani. Samitpani means basically, we're taking it metaphorically or allegorically, one is a servant of his spiritual master, humble servant, ready to do anything the guru wants. Yes, sir. Or yes, ma'am. Uh, Shrochiyam, one is heard nicely from the spiritual master and imbibed the philosophy and able to present it. And Brahma Nishtam, there's that word nishta again, fixed fixed in spirituality or Brahman. It's not that one just checks out every day, you know, 
checking in when he goes to work for spirituality, checks out when he's not working for spirituality. No, it's nishto. So that's why we say only someone who is actually God conscious or in the transcendental mode of goodness, how about that, uh, should be considered to have good qualities. Otherwise, the qualities, other qualities of will come and go. I mean, they may come for a few years, but then ultimately they may go. They will go. Of course, he does not extraneously endeavor to acquire these qualifications, but engagement in Krishna consciousness and devotional service automatically helps him develop them. So, text 20, here's another Priyaha verse. Yetu dharma mritam hidam vidoktam varipasate Shadana mat parama shadadana sorry shadadana mat parama bhakta ste tiva me priyaha yea those who to but dharma of religion amrita nectar idam this yata as uktam said paripasate completely engage shadadana ha with faith mat parama ha and taking me, the Supreme Lord, as everything, bhaktaha, devotees, te, they, ativa, very, very, it's completely very, very, may, to me, priyaha, dia. So here's this wonderful verse that ends the chapter. Those who follow this imperishable path of devotional service and who completely engage themselves with faith. Remember what I said about faith? Faith is shraddha, giving one's heart. It's not simply belief. I made that point over and over again in past classes. Giving one's heart full trust. Believing that if we do what Krishna asks, everything will be accomplished. We will be taken care of. We have nothing to worry about. Making me the supreme goal. Making Krishna the supreme goal means... Uh, realizing one's eternal nature so one can relate to Krishna in a loving exchange of one of four different types in the spiritual world. That's the goal. You know, why are you in Krishna consciousness? Well, people have other goals. Remember, we were reading before in the Bhagavad Gita, people come to Krishna consciousness, Chatur, Bidha, Pajanti, Bhav. They come because they're looking for wealth, they come because they're looking for knowledge, they come because they're inquisitive, and they come because they're in distress. That's okay. It's a good reason to come. But ultimately, one has to come to the path or the point of I'm in Krishna consciousness because I want to please Krishna. I want to connect with Krishna. I want to be Krishna conscious. I want to please Shiva Prabhupada. And if you come to that point, Krishna says here, that devotee or you are very, very dear to Krishna. So purport, in this chapter, from verse 2 to the end, from Maya Vesha Manao Yemam, fixing the mind on me, through Yetu Dharma Dharmam Dam, this religion of eternal engagement, the Supreme Lord has explained the process of transcendental service for approaching him. Such processes are very dear to the Lord, and he accepts a person engaged in them. The question of who is better one who is engaged in the path of impersonal Brahman or one who is engaged in the personal service of the Supreme Personality of Godhead is raised by Arjuna. And that's the beginning of this chapter, remember that, which is considered better. And the Lord replied to him so explicitly, that means clearly, directly, that there is no doubt that devotional service to the Personality of Godhead is the best of all processes of spiritual realization. That's Krishna's answer. It's the best. In other words, in this chapter, it is decided that through a good association, one develops attachment for pure devotional service and thereby accepts a bona fide spiritual master and from him begins to hear and chant and observe the regulated principle of devotional service with faith, attachment, and devotion, and this becomes engaged in the transcendental service of the Lord. Uh, that's very much reminiscent of what Lord Chaitanya mentioned, or is mentioned in the Chaitanya Charitamrita, in this famous quote, etc. What that uh, verse states is in the beginning, there's a little association, one has a little trust, so one associates, sadhu uh, sangho ta, that means associates with devotees or spiritualists, and then one begins to do what the devotees are doing, that's called bhajana kriya, it means the activities 
of bhakti, at least in the beginning, the activities of bhakti are in practice. Uh, and then by doing these activities of bhakti, one comes to the stage or gradually goes through the stages of anarthanavritti. Anarthanavritti means you get rid of unwanted things. I mean, unwanted things doesn't mean your old car or anything like that. It means lust, anger, greed, illusion, envy, fear, kama, proto, madamansari, bari, abaya. So these are called anarthas, unwanted things. I mean, who wants to be? I guess I should turn this. Please, please see you off because it's making noise. Hold on a second. I mean, we don't enjoy because of lust or anger or greed or avarice, which is the same as greed, uh, or fear. These things not, do not give us enjoyment. So, anyway, so then after one becomes uh, free or starts on the path of becoming free from an an artist, uh, then you become steady. We mentioned that word nishta, steadiness, 24-7 ultimately. And after you become steady, you get a real taste for hearing it chanting. So you're just hankering after doing it. It's like you're hungry all the time and you're never satisfied. Machata, madhyata, prana, bodhiyantas cha, paras param, katiyantas jamam, nicham, tushanti cha, romanti cha. Remember that verse? Tenth chapter. Remember it? It's one of the nutshell verses. So, uh, like Krishna describes, my devotees are always enlightening one another, discussing one another, and deriving great satisfaction and bliss by doing this. So, that's the next stage. Uh, it's called Ruchi. And then after Ruchi, then you have the stage of Ashakti. Ashakti means you know, complete attachment to Krishna, and then Bhava, all these wonderful emotions, and then finally you have pure love of Krishna. So this path is recommended in this chapter. Therefore, there is no doubt that devotional service is the only absolute path for self-realization, for the attainment of the Supreme Personality of God. The impersonal conception of the Supreme Absolute Truth, as described in this chapter, is recommended only up to the time one surrenders himself for self-realization. You know, it's better something than nothing. But really, it's an impediment uh, I was listening today to Prabhupada. He's Prabhupada said it's better to be a sahaja than to be an impersonalist. Why is that? Because an impersonalist, in many cases, decries the uh, concept that the Supreme Personality of Godhead has a form, personality, individuality like that, and it's quite offensive. Whereas a sahaja, he just sort of like makes his progress in devotional service or makes his execution of devotional service to be quite materialistic. He mixes it with many, many materialistic elements, but he's not that offensive. In other words, as long as one does not have the chance to associate with a pure devotee, the impersonal conception may be beneficial. Maybe. And sometimes it's extremely harmful. So when one comes in contact with a pure devotee, and we mentioned that Recently, in regard to someone who comes to our temple and meditates, and they're hearing Prabhupada, you know, they're in the temple meditating for six or eight hours a day, and they're hearing Prabhupada, but they're not jumping up and down in ecstasy. I mean, whenever I hear a Prabhupada, I just go, wow. Wow. It's like that old RCA advertisement. Of course, none of you know what I'm talking about. It's a <laughs> RCA Records used to have this advertisement with an old type of record play with a big horn attached to it. And there was a dog listening to, <laughs> to it. <laughs> and the, sorry. And the motto was the sound of his master's voice. Anyway, so that's before your time. They used to have these old records that I remember Thomas Edison, who invented the first record. It was like a round thing. It wasn't even like flat. And nowadays, nobody uses records anyway. Uh, in the impersonal conception of the absolute truth, one works without fruit of result, meditates and cultivates knowledge to understand spirit and matter. You know, it's better than nothing. This is necessary as long as one is not in the association of a pure devotee. Fortunately, if one develops directly a desire to engage in Krishna consciousness and pure devotional service, he does not need to undergo step-by-step -step improvements in spiritual realization. Devotional service, as described in the middle six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, and we're ending 
the middle six chapter right now, very sad, is more congenial. One need not bother about materials to keep body and soul together because by the grace of the Lord, everything is carried out automatically. That requires a lot of surrender. Do not worry about the materials to keep the body and soul together. But that's Prabhupada. Prabhupada came to America at the age of 70 with like $10 worth of rupees, which he never got a chance to use. And he was not worried about keeping the body and soul together. Whereas when we go traveling somewhere, we make sure we have enough money, we have credit cards, and we have everybody's cell phone number, and we have our own cell phone, and we have two cell phones in case one cell phone doesn't work. We have a lot of backup plans, but probably, really, it's just like complete surrender to Krishna. Just Krishna, take me, whatever you want, make me dance. Like you read Prabhupada's first poem when he arrived in Boston. He said, if it, your desire is you can make me dance, make me dance. And I'm your puppet. So that's pure devotional service. So, anyway, so we are interested in pure devotional service. So thus end the Bhaktivedanta purports to the twelfth chapter of the Srimad Bhagavad Gita in the matter of devotional service. And now we go into chapter 13, which we have time for. So chapter 13 is called Nature, the Enjoyer. And consciousness. So nature, the words of material nature, enjoyer. Krishna's of course ultimately the enjoyer, but we're trying to be the enjoyer. And we are conscious in Krishna's supreme consciousness. So here one who understands the difference between the body, the soul, and the super soul beyond them both uh, attains liberation from this material world. Beyond them both, comma attains liberation from this material world. Okay, so we will start this chapter. Now we get into a little deep philosophy, Arjuna Vacha. Papatim Purusham Chaiva Shetram Shetrat Yamei Vacha Itad Veditumit Jabig Yananam Kiyam Chakeshuva Oh, Krishna. Sri Bhagavan Vacha Idam Shadiram Konteya Shetram It Yabidiyate Etadyo Vetitam Prahu Shetragya Ititad Pudaha Arjuna said, oh sorry, Arjuna Vacha, Arjuna said, Prakritim, nature, Purusham, the enjoyer, Cha, also, Eva, certainly, Shetram, the field, Shetragyam, the knower of the field, Eva, certainly, Cha, also, Etad, all this, Veditum, to understand, Ichami, I wish. Jnanam knowledge, Gyayam, the object of knowledge, Shat, also Keshava, O Krishna, uh, Sri Bhagavan, O Vacha, the personality of God had said, Idam this, Shadiram, Bari, Kuntia, O Son of Kunti, Shetram, the field, Itidas, uh, Abhidiyate is called, Itat, this, Ya, one who, Veti knows, Tam, he, Rahu is called, Shetragya, the knower of the field, Itidas, Tad, Vida, by those who know this. It sounds a little complicated, but I will explain. My dear Krishna, I wish to know about Prakriti, nature. You know, nature, Krishna's nature. Uh, so there's actually two Prakritis. But here, Arjuna is mainly asking about the uh, material Prakriti. There's uh, material energy and apara Prakriti. And then, oh, sorry, sorry, this is called apara Prakriti. Uh, this material nature, and para prakriti is the spiritual nature. Purusha, purusha means the enjoyer, also can mean male sometimes. And a field and the knower of the field and of knowledge and the object of knowledge, the supreme personality of God had said, it's very easy. This body, O son of Kunti, is called the field. And one who knows this body is called the knower of the field. You could say, I know the body, but you don't really know the body until you're Krishna conscious. Anyway, so Arjuna was inquisitive about Prakriti, nature, Purusha, the enjoyer. Now, sometimes Purusha could mean those of us who are trying to enjoy this material world. It could also mean the supreme personality of God who is actually the enjoyer. Shetra, the field, and Shetrakya, the knower, the Gita's knower, and knowledge and the object of knowledge. When he inquired about all these, Krishna said that this body is called the field. 
That's our field of activities. And what we experience in this world is what comes out of this body. <laughs> we experience everything through the body. Just like if you were born with some deficient body, that is, uh, your body, you're blind, you're deaf, or whatever, I mean, your experiences of this world, uh, of this world are extremely curtailed. Because you can just experience like touch. And that happens. Sometimes people are born blind and deaf. Uh, when he inquired about, uh, Krishna said, this body is called the field. One who knows this body is called the knower of the field. The body is the field of activity for the conditioned soul. That's it. The conditioned soul is entrapped in material existence and he attempts to lord it over material nature. And so according to his capacity to dominate material nature, he gets a field of activity. In other words, you get a particular type of body according to your karma and your capacity. That's your field of activity. What you enjoy yourself or is dependent on the body. That's horrible. That field of activity is the body. And what is the body? The body is made of senses, the conditioned soul wants to enjoy sense gratification, and according to his capacity to enjoy sense gratification, he's offered a body or field of activity. So, you know, the animal is also offered a body. He's also the knower in one sense of his body. He's the enjoyer of the body. Therefore, the body is called chetra, or the field of activity for the conditioned soul. Now, the person who should not identify, who should not identify himself with the body is called chetra. Yeah, he shouldn't identify it himself the knower of the field. It is not very difficult to understand the difference between the field and its knower, the body and the knower of the body. In other words, I have a body, I am not the body. Like Prabhupada would say, one time he said to a bunch of real small kids, point to yourself. You know, is this yourself? Is your eyes yourself? Is your brain yourself? Is your nose yourself? No, we have a body, we possess a body, we're using a body. However, in the spiritual world, we are our bodies. We are not different from the body. So it's not that when you go back to the spiritual world, they have some body shop for you. You pick up your spiritual body. You have your spiritual body. It's basically, you're unaware of it, sleeping right now. Any person can consider that from childhood to old age, you undergo so many changes of body, and yet is still one person remaining. Thus, there is a difference between the knower of the field of activities and the actual field of activities. A living conditioned soul can thus understand that he is different from the body. Just it's a fancy way of describing we're not the body, we're driving the body, the body's like a machine. Later on in the 18th chapter, Yantrai, Udani Maya, the body is actually described as a machine. And Krishna is giving us intelligence, remembrance, and forgetfulness how to drive this body according to our desire. That you'll find out about in the 15th chapter. It is described in the beginning, Dehino Smen. I remember that verse? Second chapter. Dehino Smen yata dehe komaram yavadam jata tata dehan turas praptir diras tatra What does that verse say? Uh, the embodied soul passes, as a soul passes, uh, from one body to other, uh, just like, just like what? We pass from different bodies in this lifetime. Komaram yavadam jada. What does that mean, komaram? Like from komara, like a kid, a boy, to youth. Yavadam jada. Oh my God, jada, that's frightening. That means old age. Old age. And in the same way, at the end of this life, you change again. You take an, another body. And you give up this body. Uh, and it's described at the end of that verse. Uh, that particular undisturbed person, that particular person is undisturbed. If you understand that. Uh, 
uh, goodest patru in the muya to such a person who understands that's not disturbed. The living entity is within the body, and the body is changing from childhood to boyhood, from boyhood to youth, and from youth to old age, exactly what we just said. And the person who owns the body knows that the body is changing. Yes, I know. When you're young, you think, oh, I'm not going to change. The owner is distinctly shetra gya. Sometimes we think, I'm happy. I'm a man. I'm a woman. No, that would be the opposite. I'm a dog. I'm a cat. These are the bodily designations of the knower, but the knower is different from the body. Although we may use many articles, our clothes, etc., we know that we are different from the things used. Similarly, we also understand by a little contemplation that we are different from the body. I or you or anyone else who owns the body is called Shechagyak. Shechagyak means knower of the body. The knower of the field of activities, and the body is called Chetra. Hmm. Chetra just means place, okay, or field. Like you have Kurukshetra. Remember in the beginning of the Bhagavad Gita? Dharmic Chetra, Kurukshetra, Amavita, Yitzvaha, Mamaka, Pandavascharva, Kimakur, Vata, Sanjaya. What's that first say? Uh, Dhritaras is asking, you know, that uh, Dhritaras is about you. Dharmic Kshetra, Kurukshetra, that the Pandavas and Knights under assembled at uh, Kurukshetra, which is a Dharmic Kshetra. What does that mean? Kurukshetra means the uh, place of the Kurus, okay, and it's actually a special spiritual location, therefore it's called Dharmic Kshetra, means, Dharma means like uh, religion or, you know, there's different means of the word Dharma according to the context or something spiritual, or something that's the constitutional nature of someone. So Dharmic Kshetra, Kurik Kshetra, Kurik Kshetra, the place of the Kurus is a place of religion. See, that word Kshetra is used in the very beginning of Bhagavad Gita, the field of activities itself. But the field of activities for us is this thing. And the field keeps changing, unfortunately. In the first six chapters of Bhagavad Gita, the knower of the body, the living entity, and the position by which you can understand the Supreme Lord is described. In the middle six chapters of the Bhagavad Gita, the Supreme Personality of the Godhead and the relationship between the individual soul and the super soul in regard to devotional service are described. The superior position of the Supreme Personality of Godhead and the subordinate position of the individual soul are definitely uh, defined in these chapters. Mm-hmm. The living entities are subordinate under all circumstances, but in their forgetfulness, they are suffering. When enlightened by pious activities, they approach the Supreme Lord in different capacities as the distressed, those in want of money, the inquisitive, and those in search of knowledge. Remember the four types of people who approach Krishna. Now, the interesting thing is when you do approach Krishna, what does Krishna do? He sends Guru. It says the living entity is wandering. Ramanda, Ramate, Koma, Bhagavan, Jeev, Guru, Krishna, Prasadi, Bhagavan, so one is the living entity is wandering all over the different universes and uh, when he actually is ready for Krishna consciousness then Krishna sends Guru and uh, Guru implants with him his heart within the living entity's heart, is bhakti lata bij. Mm. That is also, uh, so anyway, so if one approaches Krishna, even for these ulterior purposes, then one gets guru, first of all, and then guru gives him Krishna. By the mercy of Krishna, one gets guru, and by the mercy of guru, one gets Krishna. That is also described. Now, starting with the 13th chapter, how the living entity comes in contact with material nature and how he's delivered by the Supreme Lord through the different methods of fruitive activities, cultivation of knowledge, and the discharge of devotional service are explained. Although the living entity is completely different from the material body, he somehow becomes related. That means he's attached. This is also explained. Let's see. I guess we should read the next verse here. Shetra Gyam Chapimam Vidi Sarva Shetra Shubharata Shetra Shetra Gyor Gyanam 
Yatta Jnana Matam Ma Kshetra Gyam, the knower of the fields, Cha also, Upi certainly, Ma Me, Me, sorry. Bidi no, Sarva all, Shetre Shu, in bodily fields. Bharata, Osana Bharata, Shetra, the field of activities, the body. Kshetra, Gyayaho, and the knower of the field, Gyanam, knowledge of Yat, that which taught that, Gyanam, knowledge, Matam, opinion, Mama, Mai. Osayan of Bharata. You should understand that I am also the knower in all bodies, and to understand this body and its knower is called knowledge. That is my opinion. Okay. So in other words, Krishna is the supreme knower. He's the super soul in everyone's heart. So he knows not only what's happening in your body, but also in your subtle body. What is a subtle body? A subtle body has nine intelligence and false ego. He knows what you're thinking, what you're planning, as well as what you are doing. He knows your consciousness. So Krishna knows every single body, and in one sense, the whole universe is his body. As I just described, the Garvalakshai Vishnu is the universal super soul. And that's like his body. Oh my God. That is my opinion. So purport, while discussing the subject of the body and the knower of the body, the soul and the super soul, we find three different topics of study, the Lord, living entity, and matter. In every field of activities in every body, there are two souls, the individual soul and super soul, because the super soul is the plenary expansion, the supreme personality of God in Krishna. Krishna says, I am also the knower, <coughs> but I am not the individual knower. Everybody. I am the super knower. I am present in everybody as the paramatma or super soul. One who studies the subject matter of the field of activities and the knower of the field very minutely in terms of this Bhagavad Gita can attain knowledge. The Lord says, I am the knower of the field of activities in every individual body. The individual, that's us, may be the knower of his own body, but he is not in knowledge of other bodies. The Supreme Personality of Godhead, who is present as the super soul in all bodies, knows everything about all bodies. He knows all the different bodies of the various species of life, a citizen may know everything about his patch of land, but the king knows not only his own palace, but all the properties possessed by the individual citizens. Similarly, one may be the proprietor of the body individually, but the Supreme Lord is the proprietor of all bodies. The king is the original proprietor of the kingdom, and the citizen is the secondary proprietor. Similarly, the Supreme Lord is the supreme proprietor of all bodies. That's pretty easy to understand. The body consists of the senses. The Supreme Lord is Srishikesh, which means the controller of the senses, uh, or proprietor. He is the original controller of the senses, just as the king is the original controller of all the activities of the state. The citizens are secondary controllers. The Lord says, I am also the knower. This means that he is the super-knower. The individual soul knows only his particular body in the Vedic literature. It is stated as follows. Chitrani thi sharairani Bijam chapi shuva shuve, Vani veti se yogatma tatakshetra gya uchate. This body is called the Shetra, and within it dwells the owner of the body and the Supreme Lord, who knows both the body and the owner of the body. Therefore, he is called the knower of all fields. The distinction between the field of activities, the knower of activities, and the supreme knower of activities is described as follows. This is pretty easy to understand. Perfect knowledge of the constitution of the body, the constitution of the individual soul, and the constitution of the super soul is known in terms of Vedic literature as jnana. In other words, jnana means to know the nature of God, the soul, the nature of the material world, all these things. And this is called sambandha jnana. Okay? Sambandha means the relationship between all these different elements. Remember, we talked about there's three different aspects of knowledge sambandha jnana. Avideya Gyan and Prayojana Gyan. Uh, Sambandha means just basic, the theor basically the theoretically theoretical, sorry, the theoretical knowledge of all these different elements and the relationship between each of them. That is the opinion of Krishna. To understand both the soul and the super soul as one yet distinct is knowledge. There's that philosophy of the Chincha Beta Beta Tattva, that the soul and the super soul are the same because they have the same nature, but they have different uh, identities. 
they're not the same person, but the same nature, very same nature of the soul and super soul. So there's oneness or diversity or difference simultaneously. One who does not understand the field of activity and the knower of activity is not in perfect knowledge. One who has to, one has to understand the position of prakriti, nature, purusha, the enjoyer of nature, and ishra, the knower who dominates or controls nature and the individual soul. So let's explain what that is. So prakriti is the material nature. Purusha can sometimes mean us who are trying to enjoy. We think that we are the enjoyer of this nature, whereas in fact we're not. Actually, to enjoy the nature or to even enjoy life, you have to understand Bhoktaram Jakatapasam Sarvalog Maheshwara, the fifth chapter of Gita, that Krishna is the enjoyer and the friend, the well wisher, etc. And Ishra, the knower who dominates or controls nature in the individual soul, that's Krishna. One should not confuse the three in their different capacities. One should not confuse the painter, the painting, and the easel. <laughs> Krishna's the painter. The material world, which is the field of activities, is nature. The, and the enjoyer of nature is the living entity. And above them both, is the supreme controller, the personality of Godhead. It is stated in the Vedic language in the Shveta Svata Upanishad 1.12. Bhakta Bhagyam Bhariktaram Chamatpa Savam Bhartam Chivadam Brahman Itat. There are three Brahman conceptions. Whoops, it's getting late. Uh, Prakriti is Brahman as the field of activities, and the Jiva individual soul is also Brahman and is trying to control material nature and is the controller of both of them. And the controller of both of them is also Brahman, but he is the factual controller. Let's see if we... Oh, yeah, we can finish this. We won't have much time for questions. In this chapter, it will also be explained that out of the two knowers, one is fallible and the other is infallible. Guess which? Doesn't take much to guess. We are fallible. Krishna is infallible. He's achuta. Achuta means infallible. We are chuta. We are fallible. One is superior and the other is a subordinate. One who understands the two knowers of the field to be one and the same contradicts the Supreme Personality of Godhead, who states here very clearly, I am also the knower of the field of activities. In other words, you think God and living entities are the same. Then you're contradicting Krishna's statements. One who understands the rope to be a serpent is not in knowledge. There are different kinds of bodies. It's interesting Prabhupada uses that particular example because Maya bodies sometimes would say uh, neither the rope exists nor the serpent exists, whereas devotees would say, I'm just using this metaphorically, devotees would, <laughs> Maya bodies would say everything is a Maya or illusion, whereas devotees would say a rope exists and a serpent exists, but one should not mistake a rope to be a serpent. One should understand a rope is a rope and a serpent is a serpent. There are different kinds of bodies and there are different owners of bodies because each individual soul has his individual capacity for lording it over material nature. There are different bodies. In other words, you are given a body that you ask for. Don't blame anyone else for it. You ask for it by your karma, by your desire. But the Supreme also is present in them as the controller. The word cha is significant for it indicates the total number of bodies. That is the opinion of Srila Baladeya Vidyabhushana. Krishna is the super soul present in each and every body apart from the individual soul. And Krishna explicitly says here that real knowledge is to know that the super soul is the controller of both the field of activities and the finite enjoyer. We are the finite enjoyer. Krishna is the infinite enjoyer. So Krishna explicitly says here, real knowledge is to know the super soul, which is different than the finite enjoyer, is the controller of both the field of activities and the finite enjoyer. Krishna is the supreme controller, Paramishra. Okay, so now we will take questions. We went a little longer than normal. Hold on one second. So now you are allowed. Oh, Ditch Narayan Puru is here. That's nice. We're missing you. So uh, does anybody have any questions before we make some announcements? Okay. Hello. Any, oh, oh, 
So, questions. Hello, can you hear me? Hello, can you hear me? I can hear you clearly. Okay. Uh, Pranam? Hello, Pranam? Pranam. Okay, I have a question. It is a somewhat abstract question. So, I know in the Mahabharat, there is the, the all the warriors except for Karna are uh, Chandravansh. They are not Suryavansh, which would include the Buddha, Mahavira, and Ram. And the progenitor of the Chandravansh dynasty was the god Ila. And you're talking today about the Kumar. And there's a famous philosopher that we talked about in the ashram with JG, you know, uh, Kumar Ila Bhatta. Yes. Does the name Kumar Ila mean boy of Ila? Does that mean that he was actually a Chandravansh? Like a Chandravansh Brahmin? Uh, I'm not sure about that. You'll have to look that up. <laughs> okay. The word, the word, you have to ask our Sanskrit expert who's sitting right next to you. <laughs> no, he told me he didn't know. He told me to ask you. Well, he's a, he's a, he's a pundit. He's a, he's a Sanskrit expert about all these things. He can decipher words. Tear them apart. Put them no, he together. says that the he says that the sandhi would be reflected in the name if it were like that. But he wasn't sure. He said well, it would be Kumar Ella. Yes, and I thought that was even more abstract. He's a Sanskrit expert, so he can answer these questions better than me. He's, I was ha actually having an interesting discussion with another Sanskrit expert uh, today about uh, the different words that are used in Sanskrit to indicate women. You know, so we were talking about two words. One was uh, nadi, which I mentioned previously in this class. Uh, and the other word uh, mentioned was stri. Now, it's interesting, like many times it's mentioned in, in the books that uh, stri means to expand one's enjoyment, which is actually interesting. But then looking at the uh, Manier Williams Dictionary, it doesn't appear to have any connection with that. It would probably might be something ancient Sanskrit like that. So anyway, because we were talking about the verse or having a discussion with uh, him about the verse 932 in the Bhagavad Gita, where Krishna talks about you know, anybody can approach the transcendental destination. I'm not going to go over that whole discussion, which is a very interesting discussion. So as far as whether someone's a member of the Chandra Vamsa or Surya Vamsa, I'm asking all, about I'm asking about a 10th century philosopher. Oh, who, I'm I'm not that, I'm not that expert in 10th century. You know, it's been so many years since the 10th century. I have, <laughs> you know, I have memory <laughs> lapses. <laughs> I don't know about Chanaka Pandit, but 10th century philosophers I'm not that familiar with. I know Vyasadev. I know who else do I know? I know Vyasadev, Shukadev, Goswami, and other personalities. But you're but you're sitting next to, you know, one of the biggest brains in North America, so I, ju I just asked him and he just said he didn't know. I don't know. <laughs> okay. So anyway, so who else has a question? <laughs> it's not that I can answer every question, like Actually, Prabhupada is interesting. I listen. I hear all these Prabhupada memories. Prabhupada was asked one time by someone who was challenging. He said, "He said, if you are guru and perfect, do you know how many windows are there in the Empire State Building?" You know, he was saying to Prabhupada, "Prove it. Did you know how many windows are there in the Empire State Building?" And then Prabhupada answered in a very interesting way. He said, uh, "He said." Uh, how much water is there in an illusion? You know, wow, what an answer. How much water is there in an illusion? <laughs> so in other words, who the hell cares? <laughs> so anyway, so it's not that I'm not claiming that I can answer every question about every historical person, a philosopher in India. I do know certain people, but anyway, I am all I know is my my descendants were kicked out of India 
by Parsaram. Pars <laughs> Parsaram got really angry at all the Kshatriyas, and he killed a whole bunch of us, but I, you know, my great 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 grandfather happened to run out of India to Europe at that particular time. So <laughs> that's all I know. So any <laughs> any other questions that we have here? Guru Maharaj, I'd like to ask a question, please. Sure. Hare Krishna, thank you for the lovely class. Um, thank you. There, uh, we, when we were going over the 11th chapter on um, August the 20th. Okay. You, we, we, we went over Krishna Karma. Krishna Karma, yeah. Yeah, so I just wanted to confirm. So that means giving Krishna the results of your business. Is that what that no, means? So basically, it means working for Krishna. Yes, okay. Basically, like, like I defined, if I remember correctly what I said in that class, was that the word karma can be understood differently in different contexts. Karma can mean just work. It doesn't necessarily mean the reaction to work. It can also mean work, just work. Okay. You understand? So Krishna karma, we would say Maya karma, work for Maya. Or, of course, in another context, karma means that's your karma. In other words, you get a reaction for something. Or V karma can mean bad activities which you get a bad reaction for. All karma means activities which you don't get any reaction for. Uh, karma can mean, in another context, activities that you get a good reaction for. But in this particular context, the word karma, Krishna karma, means work for Krishna. Okay, so that, that's like, so if you're wanting to rearrange your life to yes. work for Krishna, well, in service of Krishna, um, so rearranging your life and your job position would be of obviously more um, beneficial for your karma for you to work in regards oh, in alignment. It would be more be beneficial for your life. It yes. wouldn't, you wouldn't, that's interesting, you wouldn't get karma by doing Krishna karma. Okay, thank you. Car, car, I'm using the word karma to mean two different things in that particular sentence. In other words, by doing Krishna karma, work for Krishna, you don't get karma. Yes. You get thank you. bhakti. Thank you. you get bhakti points, and depending on how many bhakti points you get, you get Krishna's mercy. Yeah. Thank you, Guru Maharaj. Okay. Thank you. All right, any other quick questions? Hare Krishna Gurudev, Dandavat Pranam. Thank you very much for my class. Sounds like Nalini Khan. Okay, Nalini Khan, thank you very much for being a doctor. Okay, uh, so what's the question? Gurudev, uh, as you were explaining uh, Srila Prabhupada's purport about fallible and infallible. Uh, so infallible means uh, living entities. Uh, but uh, here, no, in, uh, infallible means Krishna. Oh, yeah. means, it means oh, living entities. Fallible means living entities. Uh, that means the body, the uh, material part, not the soul. No, 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 no. We can fall down. Fallible means someone who can fall down. Infallible means someone who cannot fall down. But of course, the pure devotee, in another sense, can be considered infallible too, because he's taken shelter of Krishna. Oh, so that is another point. Another, another place, point. Krishna says, besides the fallible and the infallible, there's the supreme personality of Godhead. But then Krishna is also infallible. It's a chuta. It's like one of those words that also is defined differently in different circumstances. It relates to the position. It doesn't relate to soul and super soul. In the in the purport that I read, it relates to the super soul. In other places in the Gita, it relates to uh, living entities who are pure devotees. They're infallible. Okay, good. Like I said, you know, the word infallible is sometimes just uh, exclusively reserved for Krishna, and sometimes it's used to refer to pure devotees. But at least the conditioned soul is always fallible. Okay, good. Because we have different deficiencies, such as, you know, imperfect senses, you know, tendency to make mistakes, uh, tendency to cheat, like that, uh, tend tendency to be bewildered, you know, in illusion. 
Yes, good. So we're we're definitely fallible. Okay. Whereas Krishna Krishna is infallible. Whereas a pure devotee is infallible because he's taken shelter of Krishna. Yeah. Thank you, Gurudev. Okay. Thank you. Very nice Thank questions. So, so there's an announcement, and I think Aditya and Ryan may have an announcement. We're coming across, I just want to announce, we're coming across, should I announce the uh, Radhasmi or you want to do it, Aditya and Ryan? Oh, uh, what do you prefer, Maharaj? Like well, you're the, you're the boss. I just work for you. So, one no, 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 no. this is seven. <laughs> Aditya and Ryan is just like amazing devotee who arranges for the distribution of so many books and gets big Sankirtan parties going out, of course, not during the coronavirus. Uh, but even during the coronavirus, he's distributing books on the internet and preaching and arranging the festivals and phew. he's an amazing devotee. Amazing devotee. I'm so thankful to be surrounded by amazing devotees. The only reason I'm able to keep everything up is because I got amazing devotees around me. It's a, it's a perfect example that Krishna provides what I lack, carries what I have, protects what I have, and carries what I lack. And because I lack so much, Krishna sends a lot of amazing devotees like Adichin Ryan. So, okay, so why don't you make the announcement? Thank you so much, Maharaj. Uh, Maharaj, actually, like everyone here, we are just like working on a drop of your mercy. Everything here is happening just by your mercy and blessings. We are no one. It's just. We are grateful to you that you're giving us an opportunity to do a tiny drop of what you do. So thank you so much for that. So uh, coming up on uh, this Tuesday is uh, Radha Ashtimi festival. And uh, so Darshan will be open the whole day. And uh, it is going to be an online festival because of this Corona. So we don't have like our usual grand Radha Ashtimi celebration. So Darshan will be open the whole day. Uh, in the evening, online program will start at 5 p.m. And then uh, His Honor B. Krishna Goswami Maharaj will be giving the class on Radha Ashtami, starting 5 p.m. And all these timings are Eastern time, Standard Time. So if you are in any other part of the world, you have to uh, convert. So 5 p.m. Eastern Standard Time, Maharaj's class on Radha Ashtami. So 5 p.m. to 6 p.m. And then 6 p.m. we'll have uh, Abhishek. And it's all going to be on Zoom and also on Facebook. So Zoom on Mahara's channel and also on Facebook on Mahara's channel and also our temple Facebook page. And uh, after the class, we'll have an Abhishek and also there are two wonderful performances by uh, Champak Lata Mataji and her uh, group of devotees. So uh, it'll be wonderful to watch those performances. Uh, so please uh, do not miss. So we have class, we have Abhishek, then we'll have two wonderful performances and then there'll be an RT or Shri Radha Golokana. So, um, so as I said, uh, Darshan will be open whole day, but our main program is online. So please log into our Zoom and you can join us through Zoom. Also, um, I'd like to mention that uh, for Radha Ashtami, you know, so such an auspicious day, the appearance day of Srimati Radharani, if you like to sponsor anything towards the festival, you know, and this is open to everyone all over the world, you can actually uh, everyone here on the Zoom call, if you'd like to be a part of the festival by sponsoring any aspect of the festival, we'll have an Abhishek, which will be on Zoom. You can actually witness the whole Abhishek and be a part of the Abhishek. The sponsorship for that is 108. The Arctic, the evening Arctic, after the performance is 108 of dollars. The Boga offerings, $151. Flowers for the DTs, $251. The DT jewelry, $251, and the DT outfit, $351. So uh, I just posted on the uh, group um, the PayPal link and also our uh, contact information. So um, my name is there with my phone number. You can always text or WhatsApp or call me and Mother Lila Shakti's phone number. So uh, even if you're international, you can always WhatsApp at this number. And um, and yes, on the chat message, you do have a Champaklata Mataji posting her performances on that day. So you can see those titles there. So that's for Radha Ashtami. So uh, please, uh, you know, consider sponsoring. We are uh, having continuing our seva, like uh, indoors, you know, we are doing all our worship. And Radha Ashtami will have beautiful dressing, beautiful like flowers, 
uh, you know, de de decorating our uh, Shishirada Golokananda. So if you'd like to sponsor the flowers, the Abhishek, the Aarti, uh, you can actually send it to the PayPal link I just posted. Okay. And uh, Mother Krishna Priya said, what time will be the dance? So five to six is the class, six to 6.15 would be Abhishek and 16 to seven. Would be on oh, the, the dance is at the dance is at after Abhishek. Uh, yes, Mara. I was thinking like immediately after class we could actually do the Abhishek. There'll be more people watching, and then we can continue. To okay. Class. But uh, I'm flexible in moving the. No, whatever, dance. whatever Champaka wants to do as far as. So Champaka Damati, would you prefer a, a dance before or after the Abhishek? She said either okay. way. Either way, either way is fine. Okay. Okay. So what are so that's, so that's uh, a schedule for Radha Ashtami and uh, uh, so um, yeah and uh, also I would like to announcement. So um, coming up on first of September is uh, Badra Purnima, and uh, Badra Purnima is the day where we actually celebrate the appearance of Krishna in the form of Sri Bhagavata. Right. So in Sri Bhagavata it's a Itself in the uh, first canto, third chapter, um, Krishna himself says, Krishna is for Dharma, Dharma Jnana Bhi Saha. Like basically, like when Krishna he finished his pastimes and left to the spiritual abode, he appeared, Kalo Drashta Nishamisha Punana Arko Dunadita. He appeared as this Purana, Sriman Bhagavatam, to give life in this age of Kali. So, all over the world on this uh, Badra Purnima, we are actually encouraging everyone to get a full set of Sriman Bhagavatam. And if you already have a full set, you can sponsor a set of Sriman Bhagavatam. Uh, you can just like we are encouraging people, just go through your contacts on your cell phone and see who would be a person that you think you can gift a Sriman Bhagavatam to. And we are, uh, we'll be shipping like you can send us the details. We, you, you can sponsor a set of Sriman Bhagavatam and we'll ship all across North America. We can ship to India. And if you are like anywhere else around the world, we can also arrange, we can see how we can ship Bhagavatam sets to that person. So please do reach out to us. Uh, you know, 1st of September, Bhadra Purnima, we have a goal of 10,000 Sriman Bhagavatam sets. This is like a worldwide goal. And uh, we want everyone to be a part of this goal. Like today morning, we had a wonderful seminar uh, by His Grace, His Holiness Radhanath Swami Maharaj, His Grace Vaishya Prabhu speaking of this glories of Sriman, of Badr Purnima, and basically, Rana Maharaj is making the point that how this is an opportunity for each one of us to celebrate this most auspicious day, to actually be a part of this Yajna, to celebrate the descent of Krishna in the form of Sriman Bhagavatam. So please consider um, um, either getting a Sriman Bhagavatam set for yourself, uh, gifting it to someone, Right, or just sponsoring a Sriman Bhagavatam and we will distribute on your behalf. So the cost for an entire Sriman Bhagavatam set is $250. So even if you are internationally, you can sponsor a set at the same PayPal address we just posted, newgoloka108 at gmail.com. And anyone who actually gets a set or sponsors a set, we are going to read your names in a special Narsimha Yagya that is going to take place in Ahobalam the place where Lord Narasimhadev appeared in Ahobalam. And uh, this will be on that auspicious day of Badr Purnima. So, um, so be a part of this Yagya. Uh, you can reach out to me. Uh, my phone number is right there on the chat box. You can WhatsApp me if you like to sponsor. If you know any of your relatives or friends who would appreciate a set and you want us to ship it out, we'll do that. But we have like uh, almost 10 days left make use less than 10 days make uh, make wonderful use of this opportunity to be a part of this mahayagya of distributing shriman bhagavatam sets all over the world so again tuesday is radha ashtami and first of september in us is badra purnima and in india it falls on second of september so thank you so much thank you thank, Maharaj. thank you and then just to remind everybody on the 26th for everybody in the whole world at five o'clock in the morning, uh, East Coast time, we're having an initiation which will be conducted simultaneously. Of course, we'll have the yoga here simultaneously in two places in Australia and one place, 
I know several different homes <laughs> in New Zealand, and several devotees are taking initiation. Some are taking initiation from me. Some are taking initiation from Ranath Maharaj. All at five o'clock in the morning on the twenty sixth, which means seven o'clock in the evening on the same day in Australia and nine o'clock in the evening, same day in New Zealand and Fiji. So you're all invited to participate in that. That will be available on Zoom and Facebook and also the Temple Facebook page. So there's going to be a, a lot of devotees. And uh, for most of you, most places in the world, it is actually Radhastami on Wednesday. Only here in the United States, I think we have Radhastami on the 25th. So you're all invited to attend that. It should be exciting. I've never done, let's say, a multi country simultaneous initiation before. Uh, a virtual fire sacrifice. Not here. Here it won't be virtual, but for everywhere else it'll be virtual in the world. So it'll be interesting. So please try to watch that. And then another point is that we did an interesting interview today or panel discussion on uh, Vaishnavi's position or Vaishnavi's position in ISKCON. And you're all invited to watch that panel discussion. That panel discussion is available right now on my Facebook page. If you want to see the discussion that took place between myself, uh, Sudharma, Anuttama Prabhu, uh, Shaka, uh, and Rukmini, I think that's, that's it, yeah. You know, very, very interesting discussion about the position of women in the Krishna consciousness movement. It's about a two-hour discussion. Thank you very much. So I think we should end now. All glories to His Divine Grace, Srila Prabhupada, Srila Prabhupada, Ki Jai, Gaur Premananda, Hari Hari Gaur.